forge your inner armor. Welcome to the Inner Armor Podcast with Dr. Timothy Royer, where we explore ways to train our brains and bodies to become dynamically resilient so that we can all, from professional athletes to ordinary people, perform at our potential. Well, welcome back to the Inner Armor Podcast. I'm here as always with Dr. Royer, who has, I think, come back from some travels. <laughs> it's hard to say because Doc is always traveling and I never know exactly where he is. So, Doc, welcome back to the podcast. Where are you and where have you been and where are you going? Oh, man, we have been all over the place this time. So I just came back from 10 days in the Netherlands working with my business partner, John. But the main reason I was there was to see our new grandbaby and see Amelia. And it was great. I had a wonderful time there. Then hit the ground pretty hard. I went down to Jacksonville. I have a son, my oldest son, Joe, who's finished up his family practice residency. And he's serving our country in the Navy and heading to Japan in six days, he and his wife, Grace, to uh, live there for three years and deliver a lot of babies and take care of our service men and women over there, which is really exciting. But I wanted to see him before he left. And then yesterday, I flew to East Carolina University, spoke to the baseball team. This team's been in our program for the last two and a half years. What a wonderful group. And their coach, Cliff, is just incredible. These guys are fired up. We talked about what it's going to take to win a national championship, and they're ready for it. So I got back late last night, and here we are on the podcast. We got more coming up, going to San Francisco in a couple of days, but that's all good. Yeah, there's a team in San Francisco, <laughs> a little little known team called the 49ers. Yeah. And as we get into the NFL season here, it's going to be pretty exciting to see how they do knowing that they have the inner armor program, that those they, they have inner armor yes. that they're going to take into the into the gladiatorial arena of the NFL with them this year, right? Yes, that's what we're trying to do. We love it. Well, we're going to talk about the Inner Armor program a little bit today and in the next episode. Specifically, you know, one of the things that I hear from people who listen to the podcast is I say, I'm real interested in all this, but exactly how does it work? Like, what exactly do you do? How do you walk through the program? And so we're going to kind of pull the curtain back a little bit today and talk about that. And we're going to begin with the beginning. And that is what we call the performance profile, which is a baseline assessment of how the user's autonomic nervous system is functioning, measured by three key connection points between mm -hmm. the internal world of the autonomic nervous system and the external yeah. world around us. And these are kind of bi directional things. So as you walk through them, understand that they're sort of indicators of how the autonomic nervous system is functioning, but they're also points of influence. So that if we train in these areas, we can influence the performance of the ANS, right? Absolutely. And I really want to encourage our listeners while we explain these things to actually be thinking, hey, I should get this assessed. These things that we're going to talk about are really important, very, very important to your health, to your day-to-day -day functioning, and to your future functioning, your memory functioning your performance functioning, if you're an athlete or an executive or in the academic arena, whatever you do, this is the concrete objective data behind it. And not just data for data's sake, but data that helps us then drive you to become the best that you can be to achieve your potential. And so really want to encourage you as you listen to these things to say, you know, how do I go about getting that? And we can do this for you. We can do this remotely any place in the world. We can send equipment to individuals to get this assessed. We can send it to teams. We can send it to corporations. We're in, as you listen to some of the back to school stuff, we're in elementary schools. So this is uh, really general information for you, but also maybe personal information that you might want to reach out and get for yourself. And we want to make sure you understand it because we don't just collect data. We take the data to then drive something that's meaningful that directs change. Well, I, you know, and I think that's one of the real differentiators for the Inner Armor program versus a lot of things that are out there like mindfulness programs or breathing programs. Not that there's anything wrong with those things, but anything that you want to improve, you have to measure. 
Yes. Right? So if I'm going to learn a new skill, like learn a foreign language, I have to get feedback on whether I'm actually using words the correct <laughs> way or how my accent yeah. is. Or if I wanted to get more fit and I was just going to go sort of aimlessly wander around outside or run around outside, but I was never going to measure how far I ran or how fast I ran. Yeah. If I want to improve, I have to begin to measure things and it's the feedback loop. Or if I went into the weight room and I just was kind of lifting objects, but there were no, I, I didn't record, I, I couldn't even see the, the numbers on the weight plates, right? I mean, if you want to get better at something, you need to know where you are and then you need a feedback loop as you lean into that and try to learn or improve whether you're making progress so you know what you need to work on, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And what the Inner Armor program does is as you begin with a baseline. We need to know where you're starting. So like if I'm going to work on losing weight, I begin my weight loss program by, you know, weighing myself. Yeah, this is, exactly. you know, this is going to be the, the Greg before and then the Greg after photo, yeah. right? And so I have to start with that before. And what we do at Inner Armor is we have something called the performance profile, which is that baseline assessment of how your autonomic nervous system is performing in three key areas. You want to explain that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And there are so many different things, the tools and things that you can use to measure, but we're very, very specific. And I've been doing this for over 30 years, assess a lot of different brains. And there's many things out there, but we want to use tools that are one measure very accurately that when I do a pre-test and then I do some type of intervention and I do a post-test, I'm able to measure the exact level of change. They're very precise in what we do. We also want these things to be very efficient. I mean, as a neuropsychologist, I have colleagues that are notorious for doing, you know, 16 hours of neuropsych testing. Well, by the time you get through two or three, what are you really measuring? Because the person's so tired and fatigued. And you have to be very strategic when you measure these things because you want to be very efficient. And so we do this whole assessment in about 30 minutes. And so we know we're getting, you know, somebody who's still alert and we're getting somebody who's not fatigued because they've been doing hours and hours of work. But in that 30 minutes, we're packing it with all kinds of stuff. And when we go back and reassess some of these things, we'll see numbers up at a near 150% improvement in some of these areas. And we wouldn't be able to show that if we weren't measuring it, if we were just kind of like doing it, you know, doing the app on my phone for my mindfulness. Well, what does that mean? Like, where am I? And you can, believe it or not, you can measure mindfulness with brainwave activity. And I wouldn't be doing a mindfulness program you know, if somebody gave me one, if I couldn't measure what's it doing to my autonomic nervous system, that's the number one principle of 10 principles we have, which will be another podcast. Number one is, does it move the autonomic nervous system? Yeah. And, and as we talk about in everything that we do on the podcast and the videos and the books and everything else, it's all about upstream downstream. So the thing is, is so much of what we look at, you're talking about mindfulness or breathing or this or that, are the downstream yeah. behaviors. But what Inner Armor and Neuro Neuroscience is really all about is if you want to affect those downstream behaviors, you have to go to the upstream causes, the things that drive those, the first domino that begins the chain, right? Exactly. And so what we're always trying to figure out is what are the levers that we have that move those upstream causes? Let's start with just the mechanics of this. If someone wants to get a performance profile, what happens? Where do they do it? Do they do it with a trainer? Do they do it online? How exactly does it work? And do they have to put on weird gear on their head or, you know, walk somebody through just the mechanics of getting the performance profile assessment? Yeah. So the way it works within the inner armor performance profile assessment is that can be done individually. So you can contact us through our website. We send equipment to your home. We have a staff person connect with you. And in about 30 to 40 minutes, uh, you'll go through the, you'll have a medical grade equipment with you that will be sent to you that will be measuring these different things and taking some different short tests. And that will then, we'll set up a time that will review your data with you. We'll send you a, a report. And with that report comes information, some different recordings that you can watch and explain your data. 
Um, the most common way the inner armor profile is conducted is typically in a setting like a university setting, a elementary school setting, a high school, a corporate office, a professional sports team. So where there's groups of people and we come together and we'll do, you know, the entire team. So we recently assessed an entire division one football team. That was a, that was a huge task, wasn't it? So, I mean, it was a lot of players and uh, we had our inner armor team members really working through all of them. And how many performance profiles did they do in like one day or something? It's crazy. They did 106 inner armor performance profiles in a day and a half. That's and crazy. It was amazing. The amount of data that we have on this Division One football team and what we know about their brain, their body, their recovery, their ability to get to their zone, the processing speed is absolutely amazing and that we can then share that with the coaches and the players so that we know how to move them forward. We don't know how to move them forward without a map. And many times we approach these things in life like it's a dark game. Like, well, I'm just going to try this. Well, that's not how we do it at Inner Armor. We're going to measure precisely what's going on, who needs what, because guess what? We're all different. And of those 106 football players, Every one of them was unique. Yeah, I was going to say, I love your analogy of the map because if I go look at a trail map or I'm wandering around the mall or whatever, if there are still malls anymore, but they'll have the map and it'll say, you are here. And because the map isn't useful to me unless I have the you are here to know where I'm beginning. And that's really what the performance profile tells you is you are here. And now we can plot an improvement path to get you where you want to be. But it's interesting with those 106 players, because you're going to get in in a moment what the performance profile measures and the metrics and all that. But it was interesting how big of a spread or distribution you had between those 106 players that we assessed, because people are all over the place. As you said, they're individuals and there's just a wide distribution. And I think it's that recognition of individuals that it's not a one size fits all, right? Yeah. And you know, that really gets lost in so many things that are marketed to consumers. And we assume like this one pill is going to take care of everything. Well, that doesn't make any sense because we're all different. There's never, ever been from the beginning of time until the end of time, anybody that's like Greg, as far as his brain, the way his body works, it's unique. Every single thing is unique. There will never, there'll be many people called Tim, but there will only be one Tim Royer that ever walks this earth, right? And I have certain weaknesses. I have certain strengths that unless I'm measuring them and then providing the intervention that fits that specific thing, I'm wasting time, right? And I'm not going to proceed further. I'm going to never make it forward on the map because I can't find where I'm starting on the map, like you said. Well, in the next episode, as we walk through the matrix, which is sort of the training platform that Inner Armor has, you see that p- people progress through the matrix at their own pace. Yeah. They move through it, right? So it's, it's not a magic pill. It's a training program in which people find where they need to work. They spend more time on certain areas, mm-hmm. less time on others. They progress faster in this area, slower in this one. And they gradually work through so that they raise those initial metrics from the performance profile assessment. And as you say, over time, you know, six months, a year, two years, whatever, however long they work through the program, they're going to see that they've become twice as good as they used to be or three times as good. Now they're performing much closer to their potential, right? Absolutely. So let's walk through the performance profile. It measures things in three critical categories, what we call pillars, precision, power, and focus. Do you want us to walk us through those one at a time? Yeah. So, I mean, again, these are built off of, you know, 30 years of researching and working with clinical populations and high performance individuals. And we just didn't randomly pick precision, power, and focus. These were like, if we could narrow it down to three things that everybody should do to help get better in different degrees based on your strengths and weaknesses, and do them in bite-sized pieces, 10 minutes or less, here's where they fall. And so are there a lot of other things to address? There sure are. 
that these are our three main things that we do tend to hit a lot of different people and have huge impacts. So the first one is precision. Precision is all about vision. So when we're taking information, it's estimated that we take in 11 million pieces of information a second. 10 million of those are visual. Now think about that for a second. That is huge. What you're taking in visually and how amazing our eyes are, are just incredible. And I refer you back to the Dr. Gamage podcast, uh, optometrist who spoke to us, who was just, I've worked with for years, phenomenal information in that podcast. But the eyes are so important to learning. They're so important to performance. They're so important to just daily functioning. And so we want to first start there. And we want to first start with a tendency that the eyes have to not work perfectly together as a team. And this can happen from early development where maybe individuals are taught to read too early and the eyes aren't ready for that. There can be other reasons. Maybe the eyes are under a significant amount of stress and so the weaker eye doesn't engage as much. But you do have to think when you think about the precision program, you do need to realize that there's these two individual eyes that have to work together in perfect synchronization. They can't be off at all. If those muscles are perfectly aligned, the brain will see double. It'll see two things. And so the moment that happens in the brain, you don't even know that that's happening, but your brain will immediately just start using one eye to process things. So a ball is coming at you and it's coming really, really fast and your muscles aren't strong enough to manage that from far to near, the brain will just immediately go monocular. And it will still see it depth-wise, but it won't have the same precision in depth. The intricacy of how that ball is going to hit the bat is going to be off. In reading, I'm going to get fatigued. I'm only going to be working off of one eye, and it's taking me forever to get from the top of the page to the bottom of the page. Now I can't even remember what I read because my eyes weren't working together as a team. So... The teamwork of the eyes is measured in convergence and divergence. And convergence is the ability for the eyes to move inward. So things coming at you or close to you. So if, if you think about it, when you're reading at something that's maybe 20 inches from you, your eyes have to turn inward towards your nose to do that. And they then have to hold that and then scan the page at the same time. And that's a very difficult task. It may be one of the most difficult tasks we have to do. And sometimes we're expecting five-year-olds to do this when they don't have the muscle strength. So convergence and divergence measure the muscle movement with convergence being things close to you and divergence would be things further away, things that you're looking at in a distance, like a board in a classroom or a quarterback looking at a receiver downfield. So on the profile, you'll see where the average level is, you know, where the borderline kind of like, this is where both eyes are working. Below that, you're probably not using both eyes. You're just using one to do this. And then because we've worked with so many elite high level athletes, you'll actually see where elite athletes fall and where you fall in that or elite executives or elite people in the academic arenas. You'll be able to see their convergence, divergence. So as you say, Doc, we have to have sort of a dynamic visual acuity. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to track things coming in, things moving out. But we also have to process it because light hits the back of our eyes. It's converted into electrical energy that moves up the optical nerve into our brain. And then from that point has to tell our, the rest of our body, you know, our brain has to process what is going on and then tell our muscles what to do. And that involves processing speed, just like the processing speed in your computer or the processing speed in your video game console. The faster it can process, the faster we can assess and react to what's going on. Do you want to explain how the performance profile measures that processing speed? Yeah, great kind of segue into that is we really don't work on processing speed until we have binocularity fixed. Because there's a lot of people that do things like light boxes and different things to try to move processing speed 
but they're doing it with one eye if their convergence and their divergence isn't good. So we always build a base of binocularity so that when I move into processing speed, then I am now going to be able to move fast with both eyes, which means I have wider peripheral field and better depth perception while I'm processing speed. So for processing speed, there's a lot of different things that could measure this. But what we decided was to go to the gold standard processing speed, which is subtest of the Wechsler adult intelligence scales, or if it's children, Wechsler intelligence scales. These are the gold standard IQ assessment. And there's a subtest in these that have been around for 50, 60 years. Okay. These tests that measure processing speed. And we use that exact one and it has a standardized grading that puts you to the exact month of your peers that you're compared to on this. So we're able to see where you fall in your overall processing speed. And then from there, processing speed is made up of a couple different things. One is for processing speed, you have to have a good short-term visual memory. So there's a subcomponent called coding that measures short-term visual memory because if you're not remembering what you're seeing, then you're not able to come up with the solution at the end. So think of like a, a player out on a basketball court and he looks to the left and he sees something going on. He looks to the center and then he looks to the right. Well, he has to remember, he can't be looking at everything at once. So he has to remember all of that stuff. We have to do that when we're reading as well, right? And so that short-term memory is very, very important for our overall performance in precision. And then there's this other component of tracking. We don't just live down a tunnel. We live in a wide open 360 degree space all the time. And so my eyes are tracking constantly. Again, we're not looking at an eye chart at certain amount of feet. We're spinning around and looking at all kinds of stuff. And that tracking is super important to see how well that works. And it's amazing how many people that have difficulties reading, we pick up on this particular subtest and we say, man, we can fix this. This is pretty cool that we can fix this. And then the last piece of the precision, which you talked about is is this visual integration. And I always tell all my athletes, all my executives, you are only as fast as your visual processing speed, okay? I can have the best athlete. I mean, this guy is cut up. He's super strong, super fast, but he will only react to a situation at the speed at which his eyes are reacting, right? Right? So he could have all these great skills, but his eyes are a half a second slower than somebody else who's not as athletically gifted, that that guy's going to beat him every single time, right? So this last piece of visual integration is, well, once I've taken it in, how do I then apply it to the rest of my brain? Like my auditory processing, my my motor functioning so that I can swing the bat with what I'm seeing and I can react to the keyboard with what I'm seeing, right? So that is that visual integration is super important to finalize the the whole context of precision. Okay, Doc. So the first pillar is precision, tracking our visual acuity, flexibility, and our processing speed. That brings us to the second pillar, power. Do you want to explain what that is? Yeah, I think uh, we've talked about this on other podcasts, but let's, let's just review. You have to remember that our whole being functions off of electrical current, okay? Is we have electrical beings. When you look at a heart, you've seen, you guys have seen this on TV shows or at the doctor's office where it's beating, right? That is electrical current. You're watching an EKG. If you look at an EEG, you're looking at electrical current in the brain. If you look at an EMG, you're looking at electrical current in your muscles. The largest organ in your body, which is your skin, has electrical current that's super, super fast that if I say your name, it, it immediately reacts, the electrical current across the entire surface of your skin, which is just amazing. This is all electricity. Well, we're making electricity, which you don't really think about, but It happens all the time. That's what keeps us alive. So the question is, where do we get this power, this electricity? 
And, you know, food is important. And it's important what you eat because that determines how clean the power is. Hydration is important because electricity runs better through water, through liquid. So we need to be hydrated well. Sleep is super important. But those only make up 10% of the resources for which we make power. We make power 90% comes from oxygen. So this whole pillar is really based on how we're using oxygen. And not just like, let's take a few deep breaths. We're talking about precise medical equipment that's measuring exactly how you're breathing every single breath, the intricacies of your breath, the amplitude of your breath, the consistency, and then cross-referencing that to how is your heart responding to that? Because that's the whole key. Your heart and your, your breathing work hand in hand. The whole, you're bringing that oxygen in and your heart is watching that thing like a hawk and saying, how much oxygen do I have? Which will tell me how hard do I have to work? Low on oxygen, I have to work harder, okay? If I've got enough, I can slow down and rest a little bit. But it's constantly, the heart is constantly working with the oxygen. So in this pillar, we're doing a ton of work around breathing, oxygen intake, and its relationship to the heart. So a few things that we measure. Right out of the shoe, we're measuring breaths per minute. The average person in the United States breathes about 14 breaths a minute. The average second grader breathes about 21 breaths a minute. We like people when they're in a calm, steady state trying to be focused to be breathing about six to eight breaths a minute. Well, that takes some real work to learn to do that. We habituate to these faster rates, but we want to teach people how to be slower in their breath making every breath count more amplitude. So you're still getting the same of oxygen in. You're just doing deeper breaths that are coming from your diaphragm versus these short, shallow breaths that are occurring from your chest. So breaths per minute are huge. And then here we also measure a cool variable, which is consistency. You know, like, it's really cool how we do this is, is we can see over three and a half minutes how consistent your breath is to the hundredth place. So we want that consistency to be less than one breath per minute. So if your average is six and a half breaths a minute, a consistency of one would put you somewhere between five and a half and seven and a half breaths a minute. I was measuring somebody the other day who was a 16 breaths a minute with a consistency of five. So that means they're breathing somewhere between 11 breaths a minute and 21 breaths a minute, which think about if your heart is relying on this fuel, like a gas, like an engine is relying on the fuel line and the consistency is all this randomness. What is that engine going to do? It's going to freak out. Like it's not going to run efficiently. And that's what happens to your heart. So consistency is super important in this area. And we want that to be less than one breath, plus or minus one. We see some elite athletes who can do 0.25, which is crazy to think about. Crazy how consistent they can be. But that then sets an internal pace that no matter what's going on externally, they can be rock solid in that moment because they are in control of the first thing, which is oxygen, which then impacts the heart, which then impacts the rest of the body. And now you're in that completely present state. So we've got our pulmonary system, our lungs, our breathing, and we've got our cardiovascular system, two critical systems in the body that have to work together hand in hand in order to provide the power for our muscles and our brain. If they work out of synchronization, that diminishes the available power, right? Yeah. So there's a way that you measure how well those are working together, and that's called coherence. It's called coherence. Yes, you're right there, Greg. And coherence is so huge and so important, especially in a place where we've kind of been inundated with heart rate variability. Everybody's talking about heart rate variability, heart rate variability, this, heart rate variability, that. And it's super important in recovery. But coherence takes heart rate variability to a different level. It's really the balance in your heart rate variability. Okay, so the heart is a muscle, so it's going to have moments that it's stressed and moments that it's relaxed. 
So think about this for a second. If the heart is relying on oxygen and I'm breathing and I inhale and then I exhale and I get to the bottom of that breath, I don't have any more oxygen. So at that moment, even though I know more is coming, the heart isn't going to wait around. What it does is it starts beating faster at the bottom of the exhale. So I exhale and then all of a sudden the heart beats faster. But then I give it oxygen and up at the top of that breath, it has all the oxygen it needs. And you know what the heart does? It starts beating slower. Okay, so these are called interbeat intervals, which lead to what we refer to as heart rate variability. That there's variability between the beats because of these fast beats when I'm out of oxygen and these slow beats when I have a lot of oxygen, okay? Not for this podcast, but in other podcasts, we talk about where's the perfect time to like hit the ball or throw the ball or respond in, in, a, in an interview. And there's a certain point in that breath that's very important, but that's not for today. But that inner beat interval is controlled or can be controlled by my breath. If you're just thinking about heart rate variability, you're just measuring the distance between those, those fast beats and those slow beats. But in coherence, we're looking at having a perfect synchronization between how many fast beats there are and how many slow beats there are. And think of like a sine wave with the heart where you have fast beats and it gets slower, slower. I inhale and then where I'm going really slow in the heartbeat and then I exhale and it starts speeding up again. Well, we want those two sides, the inhale and the exhale, to be perfectly evened. And what that means is we have an exact equal amount of sympathetic response, which is stress, with parasympathetic recovery in the breath. But that requires a breath that's right around six breaths a minute for that to happen. It can't really happen at 13 breaths a minute. It has to be a certain rhythm. And so when that happens, where the sympathetic side of the heart and the parasympathetic side line up perfectly, then what we've got is what's called coherence. And this is the beginning or the bedrock of being in the zone is coherence. Super, super important. So we measure that. We also refer to that at times as recovery points, but coherence. And then from there, we add one more dimension to that is we're dynamic beings. We're constantly changing. So I run in and I sit down and do a breathing session, right? And I start breathing a certain way and my heart starts to relax. Well, in 30 seconds, I will look different than I did one minute prior to that because I've started this slowing breathing. And so my heart will react to that. And the breath that was good for me 30 seconds ago may not be the breath I need 30 seconds later. And so through feedback on the computer, we create a dynamic breath. And that's where this whole idea of the box breath or this breath, which are great, but those are just like, just the beginning because you can literally learn to alter your breath in a certain pattern by subtle nuances of a half a breath here and a half a breath there on your six breaths a minute that will actually create more resilience in the heart and make this coherence even higher. And so through the technology we have, you learn to do this dynamic breath, which creates these things called power points, which prior to two years ago, I would have never said that somebody could get this high in coherence, but we've learned through this dynamic resilience task that people can, their hearts can do sometimes three times more than we thought they could do, which is pretty amazing. All right, so there's three pillars. We've talked about precision of visual acuity, flexibility, and processing speed. We've talked about the power pillar, which measures your breathing, the coherence of your your cardiovascular and pulmonary systems, the coherence of your parasympathetic with sympathetic systems, and how that creates power for the body. And that brings us to the third pillar, which is focus. Yep. Focus is the last one, and sometimes it's the hardest one, okay? Okay. And within focus, what we're trying to do here is unpack how people focus and kind of retrain them to focus in a way that's much more healthy. Now, some people may come through this part of the assessment and, you know, get great scores here. 
most of the time that we're going to find that they're either focused in a stressed way or they're just really low in their overall focus. And so the first set of points are our calm points. So we don't want focus to come out of an adrenal response. Like I can release adrenaline. The child darts out in front of me while I'm driving my car. I become extremely focused right away, okay? But I use huge amounts of energy and that focus isn't going to last very long, right? That isn't the kind of focus we're going to teach. Well, and one of the things that I learned from working with you over the years is how wrong I was doing it when I was in college and grad school. (laughs) Because the way I would prepare like for exams, you know, midterms and finals was do these kinds of all-nighters with coffee and everything else where you were relying on adrenaline to to just load as much information in your system, which is all amped up with coffee and adrenaline and stress. And, you know, definitely went into the exam like focused, but it wasn't necessarily a a sustainable focus, right? Right. And then when it comes to like doing life day in, day out, you know, you you can't live your life like it's finals week. No, you can't. You won't, you'll die. (laughs) So we start with, First, can we calm the system down? And so we use a skin temperature to do that and we get what's called a calm points. So we need the person to be calm first. So we're going to measure that there and that side. Then we're going to come in and we're going to measure kind of the vigilance in the system by looking at their skin conductance. So the largest organ in your body is your skin. And your skin is working off of electrical current like we talked about earlier. And we can measure that and we can see how well you can keep this electrical current under control because when you do that you're very very focused and so we're going to do a measurement which we call our centered points where we're measuring how well is your skin conductance able to maintain over time then once we can get kind of the the calm piece and the center piece then we bring in the focus points which are now based on not how focused can i get off of adrenaline but how focused can I be and still be calm at the same point? And that's where we, we get our, our calm points, which is the last part of focus. So, Doc, our brains are the most amazing thing in the universe, as you say all the time. And they work by these neural pathways, electricity throwing through the complex structures of our brain. And it's interesting because as we talked about this in the last book, Before, about 40, 50 years ago, there was no way to ever really see what was going on inside the brain. It was kind of a, well, sort of a black box. You know, it's in our head. We have no way to measure it. But technologies allowed us to look inside and sort of see how electricity is moving through it, the kinds of signal paths it's taking, the kind of strengths of those signals, the frequencies of those signals. And that technology is EEG technology. Do you want to talk about how Inner Armor uses that? to measure what's going on in the brain and how we achieve focus and what kind of state our brain is operating in? Yeah, absolutely. So everything we've talked about up to this point is part of our our base inner armor performance profile. But there are a lot of places that actually are doing, you know, we're doing much deeper research where we actually want to do brain mapping, literally looking at the electrical current in the brain. And we have technology that allows us to do that. And so some people will have, as part of their profile, they'll have an EEG along with that, which is like gold standard stuff. I mean, you're not going to get any further upstream to what's causing what's going on than you are going to get EEG. So in EEG, we look at three areas of the brain, the center, the left, and the right. In a, a full EEG with somebody like with a brain injury, you're going to measure you know, many different areas of the brain. But for the purpose of just a base brain scan, we're going to look at the center left and the right of the brain. And in there, we're looking, we, there's primarily 32 different frequencies in the brain that can be measured. But the main groupings that we want to look at are the brain waves related to your recovery. Because we recover at night, hopefully, so that we can then use our energy appropriately the next day. But if we haven't recovered well, then it's harder to function, harder to focus, harder to have energy. We might reach for other things for focus or energy. And so we can actually look at brainwaves related to this recovery and see them instantaneously at the center, left and right. And these are primarily the theta waves in the brain. And the theta waves need to be at a ratio of about 2.4 to the other brainwaves that we measure. 
And if they get too high, then we know you have too much of these waves, which lead to distraction. And that's really at the core of true attention disorders, where you get above three. But the other thing that happens to a lot of people who think they have an attention problem is they actually get too little of these recovery brain waves because they're not sleeping correctly, they're overstressed. And so these theta waves get down below two. If they get too low, they can be the precursor of memory issues. And so we're always watching the state, especially with older adults or even high pressure, you know, 40, 50 year olds to make sure this isn't getting too low and, and setting somebody up for a memory problem. So we want those recovery brain waves to be strong uh, in the 2.4 range, not too low, not too high. And then the other set of brain waves that we look in this kind of add on to our performance profile is we'll look at brain waves related to load or stress on the brain. So frequencies greater than 20 hertz are typically represented when the brain is overthinking, obsessing, in a crisis mode. We have those brain waves in there to help us in crisis, but some people like live in these brain waves constantly. And we'll be able to look at those. Those are called high beta waves and see where does the person fall in relation to what's the ideal amount and find out, wow, this person's downstream behavior or emotional issue is related to too much of this high beta wave. So it really is a very complete profile when we add on the EEG and the, the data is priceless. And to watch that change can help the person in the moment, but it literally can change the trajectory of their life, their memory functioning, how well their brain works over the time how calm they are in situations that come their way. So it's really great data to have, not just to have, but to be able to measure and then do something about and make stronger. And that's the cool thing about being a human is we can get stronger if we know what it is that we're trying to improve. Which is the whole point of the performance profile assessment, to give us that baseline, to show us on the map, you are here and now we know what to improve. We can plot a path forward. And that's what the Inner Armor Performance Training Program is all about. Now, the question is, how do we move forward? And we move forward using our performance training platform, which we call The Matrix. And in our next episode, we'll explain The Matrix and how users work through it to improve in the areas of precision, power, and focus. So, Doc, we look forward to you coming back and telling us all about The Matrix, which is exciting because it, there's been a lot of developments in The Matrix recently and improvements, and mm-hmm. it's something that's we're sort of continuously improving in response to new technologies and new things that we can do and also monitoring how users are using it. And, and it's just, it's really cool how this thing is progressing. So we look forward to talking about that next week. So thank you, Doc. And if you're interested in receiving a performance profile assessment, go to the website, forgeinnerarmor.com. You can leave us a message there for yourself as an individual, for your school, your team, your company. Uh, We look forward to working with you. And if you want to learn more about the fundamental science that underlies all of this, about the physiology of the autonomic nervous system, about how our bodies and brains work, check out the book, forgeyourinnerarmor.com. You'll find it on Amazon. And it's in both print, ebook, and audiobook form. So thank you, Doc. And I know you've got some trips coming up, as you mentioned, to San Francisco and some other places. So safe travels. And we look forward to having you back next time to talk about The Matrix. Can't wait to see you guys in The Matrix. Let's go. This has been the Inner Armor Podcast. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. Would you please follow or subscribe? and make sure to leave us a review or comment. You can learn more about Inner Armor, Dr. Royer, and how to perform at your potential by going to forgeinnerarmor.com.